necessarily the speaker <laughs> is here. Uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, to welcome you all and uh, to especially welcome Barbara Hahn uh, for this talk tonight. Um, a talk that uh, will be on uh, Rahel Leben Farnhagen and uh, Barbara Hahn joins us from Berlin, actually, at the moment, because she uh, is on sabbatical uh, right now. Uh, but uh, Barbara Hahn is Distinguished Professor of German at Bernadotte uh, University. She is Editor-in-Chief of the complete uh, works of uh, Rahel Living uh, Farnhagen, a person you might have heard of. If not, you're going to know much more in an hour. <laughs> and um, it's especially wonderful that we are going to have a presentation by Barbara Han on that book because just last year a, a volume, a, a, an edition of six volumes of this book uh, edited uh, by Barbara Han came out, uh, was published uh, in Germany, got a lot of praise in Germany and beyond, uh, for example by the Times Literary Supplement and it is also related to Bard in a way, uh, since you might know that Hannah Arendt has written one of the uh, most thought-provoking <coughs> biographies on uh, Rahel Han. This work stands in a way for Barbara Hahn's uh, work as well. It's a book, uh, uh, an, an Buch, that is Andenkens für ihre Freunde, it's the German title. So it's a book of remembrance uh, for her, her friends. So it's, and it's a book that is, was written in letters to and with friends uh, uh, of Rahel Fahrenhagen. It's a treasure of thought and joy and of sharpness and wit and also humanness that had been lost if, um, uh, if the editors of her work and far and foremost uh, Barbara hadn't taken care of this treasure that was about to, to be lost. We ha uh, if, we hadn't, uh, if, if we had not this book, we wouldn't know about uh, one of the core intellectuals and thinkers of the time around 1800 uh, in, in Germany, in Berlin especially, uh, and we yeah, can be glad that uh, that this treasure is not lost, and you will learn about that. Why? <laughs> uh, why this is in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, let me say a few more words um, about uh, Barbara Hans' work beyond this six volume, and then the complete works are additional six. Additional six. So beyond that, um, uh, she has published uh, on many <laughs> writers and thinkers. <coughs> Among them, uh, a book on Hannah Arendt's uh, thinking diaries and on Hannah Arendt's uh, poet friends. Uh, a book on uh, Jewish female thinkers uh, from the 18th to the 20th century. Books on literature of the age of totalitarianism and, uh, and much more. Some of you might have seen the exhibition was five years ago and uh, um, in the Jewish Museum in New York on, um, on Jewish women and their salons and also a show in um, Berlin Metropolis that was uh, on display here in, here in the States. Whoever has read or, or uh, a book or um, has seen a show, uh, an exhibit uh, that was done by, by, uh, by Barbara Hahn will have noticed something, and this is that in her work something is at stake, one might say. Uh, when we read those texts, we, we sense uh, that they matter. And they don't matter because they are published uh, in famous institutions, or they have uh, the blessing of, uh, of famous names. Uh, they matter because they address uh, questions that matter. Who is writing uh, 
the history of, 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 of the times we live in? Who is establishing uh, the tradition we live in? Who is excluded from that? Uh, who enables us to understand the political time we live in and we uh, interact with? With whom can we write and with whom can we think? What does the, uh, what, to what extent is our thought and writing always addressed writing and addressed thinking? A course Paula teaches, is, and this is related to all that, what is love, what is friendship in that regard? And this, I would say, undercurrent of something is at stake is especially true also for the current research project uh, she's working on, on dreams of the 20th century, which will become, may I say that, <laughs> a history of the 20th century of the extremes through, seen through dream work. It's a little strange to introduce Barbara Han in English, <laughs> for me, <laughs> um, because we have shared, we've been sharing our work over the past years in German, and uh, Barbara has uh, been a generous reader and of my work and responder to my work, and also uh, offered her work for me to respond. So um, you will see in the presentation. Uh, I'm sure, I don't know the presentation, but I'm sure you will see what kind of a um, wonderful reader and, and great friend uh, Barbara is. So I'm very, very pleased that, um, that you're here, and I'm very pleased to and excited uh, for you to give this lecture. Welcome. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. It was the most glorious day, and uh, I really enjoyed to come back to what I've been here before a couple of years ago. So thank you all for coming. And um, you know, I will take you to a world which is probably pretty unknown to you. And of course, I have no idea what you know and what you don't know. So if I'm talking about something and you don't know what I'm talking about, please interrupt me and ask questions while I'm talking. Don't wait for the end. It's easier, I guess, for you and it's so just it's it's more accessible for you if you just ask if there's something that you don't understand. Okay, so I will take you to the time around 1800, especially to Berlin. Writing with and to friends. Letters, letters, so many letters, a couple of thousands. A 16-year-old girl wrote the first one that came down to us. Ten days before she died, she penned her last billet. Rache Levine, born May 19, 1771 in Berlin. She passed away on March 7, 1833. On the gravestone, her name reads Rache Antonie Friederike van Hagen von Enzel. How are we to read these letters? They were written more than 200 years ago in a world so far away from ours. A world marked by the French Revolution, Napoleon's wars, Russia's defeat in 1806, the Congress in Vienna 1815, political restoration all over Europe, interrupted by the revolution in the summer of 1830 in Paris. A world in which nationalism developed, and the first incidents of modern anti-Semitism occurred. A world also determined by so many new ideas and new ways of thinking and writing. Apple Levine read almost all of them. Kant and Goethe, Hegel and Heine, Rousseau and Saint-Simon. She listened to Mozart and Spontini. She thought about the arts of singing, dancing, acting, and contemporary visual arts like Caspar David Friedrich's paintings. And last and not least, a world in which all the human relations had to be reconsidered. Love, friendship, family, conviviality, politics. As the letters reveal, Rachel Levine thought about all the questions of her time. She did so in as a radical manner as Friedrich Nietzsche or Hannah Arendt in later times. And like these thinkers, she established a relation to the world 
that she defined as self self-statement, think by yourself, a special kind of thinking that did not move within disciplinary boundaries and established fields of knowledge. A thinking that could not accept a systematized and firmly categorized view of the world. I quote, I do not have a stored up stock of thoughts, she once wrote, or no answer is of any use to me if I did not make the question by myself. In a letter written on October 11, 1829, Rachel de Wien described how she conceived of the said statements, the thinking by herself, how her way of thinking is related to a peculiar way of writing and publishing. She addressed her letter to Antoni von Horn, an intellectual woman who, like her, lived in Berlin, only a couple of blocks away. She wrote to a woman with whom she would spend time talking and discussing. <coughs> but obviously, there was something that had to be written down and transported from house to house. It had to be kept by the FSC, who returned the letter to Karl August Farhagen, Rachel Levine's husband, after her death. In the end, the letter had to be printed for us to read it. It renders, as we could say, a theory of thinking and writing and of transmitting thoughts to generations to follow. And now I will quote this letter, oh, part of the letter, it's a very long one. My dear and gifted friend, these remarks, drawn from a multitude of letters and a few notebooks collected by Farnhagen, are the outcome of mute, enduring, ignored pains, tears, sufferings, thinking the joys of being alone, and the boredom of being disturbed. Pearls cast up by a storm wrecked human soul over half a century. <laughs> Such treasures as you would find in the vast ocean. If the soul does not constrict itself to a mere garden pond, where its destiny would be stagnation. The ocean is oft, often stormy, gray, ugly, and it never accommodates. A soul like the vast ocean versus a soul like a garden pond. These two contrasting images correspond to different ways of thinking, of producing knowledge, and of handing it down to further generations. When a soul is constrained to the movements of a garden pond, all things have their proper names. The relation between the phenomena of the world and their representation is easy to determine. To imagine the soul as an ocean establishes a very different relation to reality. Here, the soul, the soul falls prey to movements impossible to control. Thinking is not mere reflection. Thinking would rather be the subjection to a powerful procedure in which pearls are produced. Pearls are the result of an injury. Muscles or oysters grow pearls if and when there is something intruding into their space of their body. The pearl does not heal the wound by which it was caused. It rather isolates, isolates and preserves it. In the sentence preceding the one I just quoted, Rachel Levine wrote that no crushing blow, no pinprick, no nail, no hook was spared her. These are pretty violent metaphors for describing infliction as something as fragile like a soul. But without these injuries, no pearls would come into existence. They are the result of thinking through the process of being hurt up to the point when the thoughts find their appropriate presentation, be it in a letter to a friend or be it in an entry in a notebook. Differently than in Shakespeare's Tempest, the pearls are not imagined as the transformed eyes of the father. I suppose you know this quote, those are pearls that wear his eyes. And reading and writing, therefore, would not be diving for pearls. In Rachel Levine's letters, the pearls rather signal a genuine productivity. <coughs> But like Shakespeare's pearls and coral, 
These letters do suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. With this letter as introduction, Rache Levine's Buch des Anden, Andenkens, a book, book of commemoration, could be read as a string of pearls. I would like to demonstrate how I have tried to receive this precious gift and rearrange it for further readings. It is a rather long and complicated story. Where does it begin? Let me start with a random moment. August 1984. The Jagiellonian Library in Krakow, Poland, where Rachel Levine's papers are archived, was closed for the summer. Together with the cleaning ladies, I would use the back entrance and spend my days in the empty reading room of the manuscript department. The president of this old university had granted me special permission to work with the papers of this Jewish woman from Berlin. Once again, history had intervened into the story of her manuscripts. In the fall of 1981, I had heard that the Farnhagen collection had survived the war and had ended up in Krakow. I applied for a travel grant and a visa to Poland. The travel grant was not a problem. But for the visa, I had to wait for more than two and a half years. In December 1981, the military had taken over Poland and closed the countries to foreigners. When I finally arrived in Krakow, the president of the university called me, a graduate student at the time, into his office and apologized for the delay. <laughs> he apologized in his name in the name of the Jagiellonian University and the Polish people who, as he said, never had agreed to this politics. So one day, in this very hot summer in a polluted city, one of the librarians brought me three big containers with three volumes of Rahel, I Buch des Andenkens für ihre Freunde. Each volume consists of around 600 printed pages and approximately six to eight hundred pages handwritten letters. For this very beautiful manuscript, Farnhagen had pasted each and every page of the former edition of the book into a larger mound of thick paper so that he could write on the margins. And I will show you how that looks. So, this is the formerly printed version, and here on the margins you see his handwriting. And if you notice that you can't decipher what we, decipher what he wrote, it's due to the fact that the German alphabet was not the Latin alphabet. The Germans came up with a very peculiar idea to create a very special alphabet. It's based on the Latin alphabet, but it's different. That's the one you can't just read what he wrote. So it's similar to the, to, the, uh, to the Latin alphabet, but it's not the same. And I will talk about this difference. <laughs> oh, it looked like that. Like that. <clears throat> On these margins, he added all the passages he had to cut out in order to get the book published. The 1830s were times of harsh censorship. He also had copied dozens and dozens of previously unpublished letters of colored paper and integrated them following the chronological order. It looks like that. He loved color, as you can see. Blue, pink, green, censorship, as you can see. <laughs> So what I held in my hands was the never published opus magnum of Rachel Levine, this extraordinary woman. A book as influential for the reception of her writings as the Wille dort zur Macht, the will to power for Nietzsche. This is a book that Nietzsche never wrote. <clears throat> to compare these two compilations of texts is not as far-fetched as it might seem. Both, both authors left behind a plethora of unpublished texts and the open question of how to arrange them into books. 
Elisabeth Förster Nietzsche, this is the sister of Nietzsche, compiled her brother's alleged masterpiece by ignoring the archival order of Nietzsche's papers, a book that was meant to overshadow Nietzsche's published work. The story is, of course, different in Rachel Levine's case. When she died, her papers consisted mainly of the letters she had received and not the ones she had written. In those times, the only way of keeping a copy of one's own letters was to write them twice, a rather time-consuming enterprise that she almost never undertook. And at the time, paper was very expensive and ink was expensive, so even for those reasons, people wouldn't write their text twice. So to compose her opus magnum therefore required to first collect her letters from her friends. Rachel Levine, however, had already developed an idea of how to arrange these letters for publication. In the letter to Antonio von Horn, with which I began, Rachel Levine is talking about a collection of remarks, of reflections, that she is sending to her friend. A collection that just had been published in a journal, which was called the Berlinische Letter für Deutsche Frauen, the Berlin Journal for German Women, edited by a friend. It contained a montage of excerpts from her letters and fragments taken out of her notebooks and arranged chronologically. That is exactly how the first edition of Rahel, Ein Buch des Andenkens, is composed. A collection of letters Rachel Levine had written to very different people peppered with excerpts from her notebooks. The book came out in July 1833, only four months after Rachel Levine had passed away. As notes in her papers show, the manuscript for this publication was already almost finished when she died. In the year to follow, Karl August Farnhagen, her husband, must have spent most of his time writing letters to his wife's friend and asking them to send back her letters and to prepare them for publication. So, this is for, oh, this is for example a list and he writes, I'm still hoping, hoping to get letters from all his people and then he lists all the names of the people and if he got the letters, he parted it out. So he got the letter from this woman, from this woman, from a bum, he's still waiting for these letters. So he put this on his list. Another one. Another one. So as you can see, he was a meticulous worker and he tried to put this book together. <clears throat> In the summer of 1834, the second edition was published. In its set of 500 pages of the first edition, which fitted easily into one book, the text now had to be, had to be divided into three volumes each of which contained of almost 600 pages. That's the title page of this edition. Again, this is this kind of peculiar German alphabet, but I think it's easy to read. This is Buch des Andenkens, Book of Commemoration for her friends. <clears throat> and now, my story with the Buch des Andenkens starts all over again. When the librarian in Krakow gave me the third and never published version of this book, it did not take me long to realize that these manuscripts asked for publication. Not much did I know about the difficulties I would encounter on my long, long way to presenting these letters to the public. It took me 25 years to bring out this edition. Just nothing. So this is nowadays. And now, of course, we choose the Latin alphabet, so it's easier to read it. <laughs> if I remember it correctly, I wrote three grant applications <laughs> for three different German institutions. None of them gave me any money for working on this book. American universities, first Princeton and then Vanderbilt, made this edition possible. I was in touch with three different publishing houses, and over the years, I worked together with 10 graduate students from three universities. It was a complicated procedure, as you can see. But why? It is not only the sheer amount of text. 
transcribing and collating. Collating means you have a transcription and then you have to compare it with the original to catch all the mistakes. Transcribing and collating almost 600, 1,600 letters took years, as you can imagine. And to edit and proofread 3,500 pages is a pretty nightmarish enterprise, <coughs> as you can imagine. Much more difficult to deal with were all the questions that popped up along the way. As we know from the fight over Nietzsche's Nachlass, his papers, there are no mere editorial decisions to be made. They are all theoretically and very often politically charged. The most important question again and again remained how to publish these texts at the beginning of the 21st century. What would, what would be the appropriate type of a book? A critical edition with annotations would have been impossible. The Buch des Andenkens is composed of Rache Levine's letters transcribed by Karl August van Hagen, her husband. And van Hagen changed the orthography. He inserted a comma here and a period there when he considered a sentence as being too long. He cut sentences and paragraphs, integrated two letters into one, and so forth. He produced an edition according to the standards of the 1830s and 1840s. His book des Andenkens could therefore be seen as an historical document. An edition we would nowadays call an edition for the public sphere, not for, for scholars. In a series of notes regarding a future edition of the book des Andenkens, Van Hagen is very precise about the way he wanted the book to be published. Oops, that's the wrong image. Here. Regarding a new edition of the book Rache, that's what he writes here, <coughs> he suggests to include many more letters and also a couple of answers to Rache Levine letters, to number all the letters and to add an index. An index of names and subjects needs to be added, that's what he writes here. <coughs> and he insists that the structure of the book should not be changed. It was no problem to accept these suggestions. My, in, my edition is indeed a kind of a edition for the public, for a public audience. I'm not undertaken, but with a very precise index. That's the index. So you will find all the people she's talking about. But why did Van Hagen, who survived his life for 25 years, never publish this book in which, in which he had invested so much time? In the first volume of the unpublished version of the Buch des Andenkens, we find the following remark. If from these three volumes, manuscripts will be chosen for a new edition or special publications, the letters shall be copied but not ripped out of the book. The book must stay complete. For the time being, it will not be possible to publish these texts in the version as presented in the books. It will be necessary to make choices and to leave out passages. <coughs> Berlin, February 20th, 1843. In this note, Van does not have much hope. He knew that censorship in Prussia would not allow for bringing out texts like these. As far as we know, it was on August 28th, 1849, this is Goethe's 100th birthday, that Van Hagen had to accept the fact that he would not be able to publish his wife's masterpiece during his lifetime. When in March 1848 the revolution took over the streets of Berlin, there was hope for a more democratic Germany, a Germany without censorship, a hope that history's turn would soon betray. Instead of publishing the book, Van Hagen saw to it that his and his wife's paper would end up in a public institution. In his will, he dedicated his treasure to the Royal Library in Berlin. And there, the manuscripts were accessible for scholars. Among them, Hannah Arendt, who wrote her biography of Arthur Levine Van Hagen almost exclusively based on the unpublished manuscript of the Buch des Andenkens. In 1941, the Nazi government decided to transport all the manuscripts and rare books stored in Berlin to a monastery in Silesia where they survived bombing and fire. 
1945, the Red Army transported its hundreds of boxes to Krakow, at the time the only city in Poland with a functioning research library. All the others were nothing else than piles of rubble. You might know that the first thing that the Nazis did when they occupied Warsaw was burning the National Library of, Warsaw, of Poland. <clears throat> in Krakow, all these containers filled with manuscripts set for decades, and except of the librarians, nobody touched them. When I arrived in 1984, I was the first scholar to, walk, to work with these manuscripts. Like Nietzsche's Wille zur Macht, the way to power, the Buch des Andenkens dominated and determined the reception of Rachel Levine's writing, for obvious reasons. Karl August found that his copies of the letters are much easier to read than Rachel Levine's manuscripts. And I will show you now a manuscript by her that looks like that. <coughs> and you can imagine this is not so easy to decipher what's written there. Up to now, almost all responses to her writings are biographies. The chronological structure of the book invited readings in which this representation of time was translated into a narrative. The string of pearls, however, allow for totally different approaches. While Nietzsche, from a certain point on, wrote to his Nachlass, his paper, so to speak, Rachel Levine almost always addressed her writings to friends. During her lifetime, she corresponded with more than 300 people. The Buch des Andenkens contains letters written to 125 addressees, which was quite a lot, I would say. This friends, as the title suggests, a book for her friends, are seen as a constellation. The motto of the book makes this very clear. From the very first edition on, the title page of the Buch des Andenkens displayed four significant words calm and moved hyperion. That's the model. What does it mean? Hyperion, this might refer to a book title, a novel composed of letters and written by Friedrich Hölderlin, a very famous German author of the time. It might also refer to the character in the book who is writing letters to his friends and his beloved Diotima. Hyperion, and not Hölderlin, the author's name, as the one who wrote the quoted words, open up a new reading of Rachel Levine's book. Rachel, a book of commemoration for her friends, a title but no author. Hyperion and Rachel might correspond. <clears throat> they are both writers but not authors. They both address the writing to an adversary and they both write quite literally in a constellation calm and moved. The motto is taken out of a letter that starts, and I quote Hölderly to you, it is long since I have been as I now am. As Jupiter's eagle listens for the song of the muses, so I list for the marvelous, unending euphony in me, undisturbed in mind and soul, strong and joyous and smilingly serious, I play with fate and the three sisters the holy Parsi. Full of divine youth, my whole being rejoices over itself, over all things. Like the starry sky, I am coupled and moved. The writing, I, is not only writing in a constellation, the text is addressed to a friend, he imagines himself being a constellation. The motto, so it turns out, provides a precise theorization of how the Buch des Andenkens is written and composed. The letters are like the starry sky, creating context for one another. And each and every letter is a constellation in itself, calm and moved. It takes up thoughts from other letters, responses, conversations and books. What does this imply for an editor at the beginning of the 21st century? How to carry on constellations created 200 years ago? Let me give you three examples of the difficulties in I, I encountered and what I decided to do. Farnhagen, 
never gave the manuscript the final touch. As I told you, he couldn't publish it because of censorship. So I suppose he would have noticed many mistakes and inconsistency, especially in the heading of the letters. For example, one letter was addressed to someone called Gustav Brinkmann, first name and the last name. The next letter was addressed to Gustav von Brinkmann, which signals this guy is, um, is a nobleman. Or the next letter was addressed to a Count Pückler. The next one was giving the first name Hermann von Pückler Muskau. So the same person would show up with four or five different names. I decided to make the heading on the letter my text, so that they would all look alike. And that I would write this heading as an editor of the 21st century, which means without any reference to nobility and with a first name for everybody. In the 19th century versions, women almost never had a first name. So they looked like that. It's just two, ba bum ba bum, where and where was it written, and that's the date. <clears throat> the next problem was not so easy to solve. In the container holding the first volume of the Buch des Andenkens, I found copies, Farnhagen's copies, of 25 letters written by Rachel Levine to her lover, a guy called Ra Don Rafael Dorquillo, a Spanish diplomat, and they had a very passionate love affair. These letters are not integrated into the Buch des Andenkens, but they are stored there in this container. What to do? In the Buch des, An the Buch is, des Andenkens was written by Rachel Levine, but it also was written by all of her friends. If they decided not to keep her letters, they got lost. In the Buch des Andenkens, we cannot hear the voice of Rachel, the lover of the man with whom she was in love because the men themselves or the families decided to destroy the letters. As far as we know, Rafa Levine asked the Spanish lover Okicho for her letters after they broke up in 1804. Here are some of his love letters. <clears throat> Obviously, she received some of these letters and later found out and transcribed the letters and prepared them for publication. But they both obviously decided not to include them into the next montage they published during Rachel Levine's lifetime. But here they are, in the container stored together with the manuscript of the book. After long considerations, I decided to make them part of my edition. What I hereby created is a new perspective of the constellation. In Farnhagen's version, fragments taken out of her notebooks no. Determine the years of the love affair, 1802 to 1804. We see a woman thinking about love, friendship, war, and so forth. Now, in my version, we also read of a soul in turmoil, struggling with an extremely difficult love affair. 25 letters, almost exclusively written in French. Did I do too much? I'm still not sure. So here are these letters. And as you can see, it's a tortured love affair if you read it. And it's actually it's very interesting because, of course, you ask yourself the question, why was this love so totally impossible in, between these two people? The last example. In the constellation of letters, as arranged in the book, each and every letter lives <coughs> in the context of the surrounding texts. We read them in a very special environment of thoughts and ideas. So what to do when it turns out that the letter bears the wrong date? It is easy to mix up days. Is it Monday or Tuesday today? October 1st or October 2nd? That Rafa Levine writing so many letters sometimes got the day wrong should not take us by surprise. Getting the month wrong is more surprising. I'll give you one example. One sequence of letter reads, Thursday, January 8, 1827. Friday, January 9, 1827. Friday, January 12, 1827. That can't be. It turned out that the first two letters were written a month earlier. But most surprising was how often Rachel Levine got the year wrong. <laughs> Van Hatten did not misread the date of the letter. That's the manuscript. It was dated Berlin, March 12, 1810. Can you see the pen up there? 
here, line 8 to 10. So we place the letter between two other entries from the same year. When I prepared the correspondence of Rachel Levinus, this woman who got this letter, I noticed that the year was wrong. How did I figure that out? The response from this woman was written on April 3rd, 1811, very precisely and almost echoing sentence by sentence of Rachel Levine's letter. A strange mistake. It should not take us by surprise when the letter written in January or even in February shows the wrong year. But by the month of March, we usually have accepted the fact that we ended up in a new year. And here, not just one, but two letters with the wrong date. Only when I proofread the manuscript, I noticed that a letter to a friend dated was written almost at the same time also got the wrong year on it. <clears throat> in the end, the sequence of, le of letters in both years, 1810 and 1811, changed substantially because I had to replace the letters. <clears throat> I did, of course, not change Rachel Levine's texts. The strange mistake, according to Freud, we would rather speak of a phenice than a Freudian slip, is still visible and can be read. So where is it? Here. So there's a printed version, and of course I said 1811, and I left her 1810 the way it was. So you can see there's something going on here. These are just three examples. There are many more. Looking back, I created a new book, a book that was not envisioned by Karl August Farnhagen. Sometimes I had to ask myself the question whether I was getting too close to Elisabeth Förster Nietzsche and too far away from Farnhagen. Anyhow, the new edition of the Buch des Andenken is much more mine than I had intended. Now it has one more author. Besides of Rachel Levine and of our friends, besides of Farnhagen, who did most of the work, it is now me who very often decided not to follow Farnhagen's suggestions. It is, after all, a publication for our time. In order to make the book accessible for readers in our world, I added an editor's volume, so to speak. We do not share the knowledge the first readers of the letters had at their fingertips. Rachel Levine loved to quote lines from poems or dramas, from arias or popular songs. Most of the time she does not mention who she, what she is quoting. It was not necessary because her advocacies knew the context. We don't. So I put together a long, long list of hidden quotes and those without any reference to an author or a composer. This list, it turned, so it turned out, is in itself very interesting. This is a list of quotes without a reference. <coughs> so as you can see, there's a lot of Goethe showing up. And you know, these people, they knew Goethe by heart. It was totally unnecessary to say, listen, I'm quoting Goethe here. And this list, I would say, introduces us into a culture of a lost world. If it's not a quote, but rather a proper name, or something that sounds like the title of a book or a play, the reader might turn to the index. I followed Farnham's wish and spent years and years trying to figure out what our author was talking about. Is Madame Meyer mentioned in the letter, let's say, in the year 1808, the same Madame Meyer we encounter in a letter written 10 years later? And who are all these women called Yetchen and Yetchen and Fanny? In the course of the correspondence, there are at least half a dozen each. Or, I didn't like Heinrich yesterday, we might read in a letter. Heinrich, is that a proper name, a character in a play, or the shortened version of the title of a book? In a pretty detailed index, you will find the answer. So it looks like that. And who are all these people to whom the letters are addressed? In a long chapter, I introduced, introduced all of them. Some entries are very short because I could not find much information on some of the friends who received Rachel Levine's letters. Some are a couple of pages long. I told the story of the friendship try to reconstruct how many letters came down to us, and if and where they were published. It looks like that. This is, for example, a very famous actress of the time. This is a 
a friend that was also very important for her. And here I just introduced all these people. This is Wilhelm von Humboldt, you might know his name. He's the founder of the Modern Research University, also a close friend of hers. At the end, I decided to add one more chapter. I called it Documents. There you'd find a mixture or a montage of texts that I, that I felt should be part of the edition. Too many of Rachel Levine's close friends are absent in the book because they did not keep her letters. Especially the 1790s show a very strange pattern of letters. And actually, if we look back, it's kind of obvious. So in the 1970s, all these people were your age, 20. And how did they know that one day they would be important? Why would they come up with the idea to keep the letters? See, if you write nowadays, you, you use a computer, and you always have a copy of what you write. All the programs we use, they copy our letters that we send to other people. Each email program does that. But at this time, of course, nothing. So you had to write it twice if you want to keep it. And obviously, most of the people <laughs> had no idea that they would be those who we still remember of this time. So they didn't keep the letters. So many of the close friends are absent in the book because they did not keep her letters, especially in the 1790s. In the book, Buch des Andenken, there is only one single letter to be found written to a Jewish woman at the time. And there was a huge circle of Jewish women talking to one each other. It's a letter to Henriette Mendelssohn. That is the, the, um, the Homet and Moses Mendelssohn youngest daughter. You might have heard of Moses Mendelssohn. And it's an extremely interesting letter because it discusses the pros and contrast of marriage. <coughs> Dorothea Feit, the sister of Henriette Mendelssohn, who later would marry Friedrich Schlegel, absent. All the other Jewish women absent. Obviously, it had not occurred to them to keep Rachel Levine's letters. Other close friends, with whom Rachel Levine also was engaged in ex extensive correspondences, in her papers we find the letters written to her, absent. At least 20 exchanges of letters, each of which would have easily filled the book, are lost. In order to point to this loss, this chapter presents one letter that each of these friends wrote to Rachel Levine. So here are all these friends. It's interesting, Rachel Levine kept the letter from all these people, so she knew what she is doing is extremely important. And I also added two letters written in Hebrew characters in a mixture of German and Yiddish, written by Rachel Levine's mother, Chaya Levine. Where is she? Here. Writing to her daughter. Here you can see she used um, the, the Hebrew calendar. And she's writing from, from Leipzig. She traveled to Leipzig to live there. She was a very independent merchant woman. And from there she wrote home to her oldest daughter. She was 14 at the time and told her what she was supposed to do with her younger siblings. And interestingly enough, this young daughter kept her mother's letters, but the mother did not keep her daughter's letters. So we have these letters, but not the answers. There's another, whoops. So there are two. Where the other one I didn't take a picture. So and if you if you look at um, at the German, it's a very interesting mixture between Yiddish and German. So of course she had to go back and forth between two languages. But she attended the fair in Leipzig and she sold stuff to people. She would talk to them in German. But when he, when she turned to her family, she would still use Yiddish. And she used Yiddish when she wrote to her daughter. The chapter ends with an entry that I thought needed to be part of this edition. It is a paragraph taken out of a letter to Rachel Levine's brother Ludwig Gober, whom she sent a report of the so-called Hep Hep riots in southern Germany. This was the first outbreak of modern anti-Semitism. And I quote from this letter, I boundlessly said, she wrote on August 29, 1890, and in a way I have never yet been, because of the Jews. It's a very interesting and moving letter. Farnhagen might have had his reasons for not integrating this letter into his collection. Today, we need to read it. Reading. 
correcting the table scripts of Rafa Levine's letters taught me so much about our incapability to read. <laughs> I came across the most interesting misreadings, not only of words, but also of sentences. Obviously, we always tend to read our own text and not the one that is lying on the table. For example, one of the students who transcribed letters, he was madly in love and unfortunately he was unhappy in love. And so he produced the most amazing mistakes. <laughs> he wrote his, his unhappy love story in the transcriptions. At the very end, the, book, the part of the book in question was already printed but not yet bound. I happened to stumble over a sentence that did not make any sense. Oh, this is the anti-Semitism letter. Oops. What happened now? I don't know. Okay, but I will explain it to you. I stumbled over a sentence that did not make any sense. Rachel Levine, exiled in Prague, while Prussia was on war with Napoleon, ran out of money. After months of severe illness, she was forced to write to her oldest brother and ask him for money. She had spent four weeks in bed, so we read, when one day she tried to cut up Hufe, that's the German word, word for horseshoes. The strongest pain in her body prevented her from continu continuing continuing the strange activity. Why would a sick woman living in a small apartment on the third floor of a very old house in Prague even have a horseshoe in her house? And neither in German nor in English would we cut out this piece of metal. The manuscript revealed that Mademoiselle Levine did not prepare horseshoe for lunch or dinner. I think Charlie Chaplin was the first one to munch on a shoe. She rather tried to cut up which is a German word for chicken. <laughs> and the mistake is very easy to understand because in this strange, <coughs> peculiar German uh, alphabet, H and F look similar and E and N look similar. So who for horseshoe and who and chicken, they look pretty similar. But what did the student think who deciphered the letter and typed it up? And what did I think when I collated the title script with the manuscript? And what did the most meticulous copy editor not catch the mistake? And how was it possible that no one was puzzled or surprised or whatever when we proved by the galleys? My editor couldn't stop laughing when I told him what I had found. And for a moment we thought, why correct it? One day, a young scholar might write the most interesting essay on this poor sick woman with their horseshoe. At the end, we did correct the mistake and had this part of the book printed anew. After this encounters, I'm convinced that you, the readers, will find many more mistakes. You will find the traces of thoughts and wishes of all the people who worked on this project. But, so my question, could that be also read as an act of friendship? All of us who worked on the book received his manuscript like a gift and transformed it into our own book. In and with these mistakes, Rachel, I put this Andings for her friends, this book for her friends, arrived in our time. Let me end by thinking about the book of commemoration, not as an editor, but as a reader. Not in the role of the one who is handing the strings of pearls down to posterity, but rather in the role of a pearl diver, as Hannah Arendt described Walter Benjamin's relation to history. I can't help but think that Arendt echoes Rafa Levine here. There are no pearls to be found in Walter Benjamin's texts. He never played with this metaphor. But there is this image of pearls cast out of the past ocean of a human soul in turmoil in this letter with which I started. Hannah Arendt read the letter in this now published version of the book des Andenkens. She took this image and turned it around. In her reading, it is not about producing thoughts. It is about receiving thoughts from a past from which we are centuries and light years away. A past from which we are divorced by prayers and tradition. But the thoughts are still there. They are waiting for us to dive for them. And now I quote the Hannah Arendt quote to you. 
like a pearl diver who descends to the bottom of the sea, not to excavate the bottom and bring it to light, but to pray loose the rich and strange, the pearls and the coral in the depth, and to carry them to the surface, this thinking delves into the depth of the past but not in order to resuscitate in the way it was and to contribute to, re to the renewal of extinct ages. What guides the thinking is the conviction that although the living is subject to the ruin of the time, the process of decay is at the same time a process of crystallization, that in the depths of the sea into which sinks what once was alive, some things suffer a sea change and survive in new crystallized forms and shapes that remain immune to the elements, as though they waited only for the pearl diver who one day will come down to them and bring them up into the world of the living, a thought fragments as something rich and strange. It doesn't matter where we open the book. There is always a remark, a thought that catches the attention and asks to be read. And I will just read you a random selection of thoughts that I'm finding there. First, my favorite one, March 1803, an entry from a notebook. Slave trade, war, marriage. And they wander and merely patch up things. June 1809, a letter to Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was just about to work out the structure of the modern research university that would exclude women and Jews. And she writes, what studies we might have completed with one another, one another, what worlds of life we could have discovered, what accounts you could have gotten from me. You should be ashamed, you sedulous, incompetent researcher. <laughs> Last but not least, a letter to Alexander von Nermavitz, a very close friend, <coughs> May 16, 1811. This compartment into which every human soul is concealed and where love from time to time wets life and life as light carries over a gift from heaven, this is a horror that makes one stiffen. The thinker's occupation passes over into prayer, and I despair, and so forth. My hope is, of course, that the new edition of this book will encourage many readers to dive for pearls and to create new strings of pearls. There is so much to be found. Thank you. So in some letters she uses the Yiddish name and the German name. 
And Farnham tried to, to catch all these mistakes and kind of gentrify the names, but sometimes he didn't find a name. So in one letter he would try to the Yiddish name of a friend and the German name, and I would not change that. So whatever she did, I would just leave it the way it is. But I would not keep what she did. And if you want to know that this person is a count, look up the name in the index, and in the index you would find all the titles because they were extremely important at the time. But for the title of the headers of the letters, what I thought is, you know, this is so much 19th century. Women don't have a first name, and you know all these problems. So I thought, if I want to make that accessible for other times, I should, I should kind of streamline it in a way that you, you are forced to see that I did it. And I gave all the necessary information. For example, if I could figure out who is this person and where is this person located at the time, I would give not just the name, but also the location and the date. So, actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this was a good decision. With the other oh, no, I'm just <laughs> curious. <laughs> but you know, I had, I had so many doubts. This was, it, it, this was an easy decision because I thought, okay, Nowadays you would do it this way, and so I did it. Yeah? I have uh, two questions. Actually, the real, what I'd really like to ask is for you to give another lecture about uh, dreams of the 20th century. <laughs> okay. I want to ask that. Tomorrow. Uh, okay, we'll come back. Um, a small question and then a larger related question. The small question is whether it's your sense or whether you know that she was um, Levine was writing, was such a, a massively prolific letter writer and did not write a big book or a few big books. Yeah. Right? That, that decision was a conscious decision yes, on was. her part. Yeah. Uh, and if so, a bit more of why. That's the yeah. smaller question. <coughs> the larger question is related to this, about if you could say more about uh, her conception of self thinking. Yeah in relation to larger themes of, uh, that are at play in German idealism. I'm thinking, particularly, it's particularly interesting that she would be developing a, a theory of self-stanking yeah. in the, I just know what you said about it at the beginning, but that she would be developing that theory specifically in the context of writing letters to others, in, in the constant dialogue yeah. with others. And so I'm thinking about how she relates to, the, say, from Kant's concern with autonomy yeah. through concerns about subjectivism in Fichte yeah. to Hegel's conception of recognition, Anna can, mm. is she, I'm, I'm sure she's thinking about those, where she fits in that connection, and if there are explicit uh, ways of thinking about her decision to be a letter writer in relation to problems of autonomy and Anna can yeah. in, in the idealist. Actually, the two questions are closely related. So the first question, she was a woman and she was a Jewish woman. And women around 1800, they were supposed to write novels. There was a very interesting division all of a sudden established in, 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 in this, let's call it, a system of writing. Because in former times, there was not such a kind of established difference between literature and theory. So, and people could move back and forth between these different ways of writing, but it kept, it, the, the moment we think about a kind of a new research university, we have, to, we have to establish differences. And this difference meant for women, they are the ones who, if they write, they are on the side of literature, but they are not on the side of theory. And okay, they are women, and they are not interested in producing novels. And she definitely was not interested in producing novels. She was inter interested in producing, let's say, theoretical work. And there was no way for women to produce this kind of work. No one would have printed that. So if you wanted to be involved in, in a, let's say, a theoretical project, there was no way to publish like Kant or Fichte or Hegel. It, this was just not for women. So if you wanted to be part of this discussion, you had to come up with a different genre. And the genre at the time that she could think of was the letter. And this is actually the self-thinking. Think by yourself and don't believe what other people say. Of course it's related to Kant. And she was a very close reader of Kant. And I think she took the Kant thought and took it 
even a step further. And she said, if you want to be selbst, there's not just one human being on this, on this planet. Human beings are always connected to other people. And you have to, you, you have to address your thought to someone else. And then you have to try to get a response in order to figure out if that thought is right, correct, true. And from this perspective, actually, she's not criticizing Kant. This is the basis. But later she's criticizing Hegel, which is very interesting. Because now we're in a different world. In Berlin, there are no more the salons where people got together and talked and talked and talked. What she's complaining about is that the young men don't come to the salon anymore. They go to the university and listen to lectures. Mm -hmm. And they can't talk anymore. Because in a lecture you're not supposed to talk, you're supposed to listen. But in a salon you were supposed to be part of a dialogical thinking procedure. So the men are losing something and Hegel is kind of putting that into a theoretical framework. And this is a pretty harsh critique. And actually, to take it a little further, Nietzsche has a couple of remarks on her, and that's exactly the point that he got, that she was interested in this addressed thinking, in this dialogical thinking. So that's why I try to make this connection from her to Nietzsche to Hannah Arendt. They are kind of, they are siblings in thinking, so to speak. Since you mentioned the, this, this harsh critique on uh, Humboldt, yeah. could you Actually, that's could the, same, it's the same thought. Yeah. Because the encounter of Levine Humboldt was obviously intellectually really important. And they started to, 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 to think about it. It was 1810, after the defeat of Russia, and Napoleon was not defeated yet. And the future of, of Germany and the future of Europe was up in the air. There was so much to think about. And she wanted to, to continue this debate with Humboldt. What he, he do? He sat down and, uh, and, and pinned down uh, the, the idea of how to create the modern university. And the modern university says to women and Jews, not for you. And so there's no, there's no dialogue anymore. So he doesn't dare to continue this dialogue and to be engaged in this encounter, no, he decides to come up with an, with an institution, and this institution, especially in Europe, established a borderline between men and the rest of the world. They were, had no access to this world of thinking anymore. And this is um, actually, if you look at the American University, it was not so difficult to integrate women or other minorities, but it was also almost impossible in Germany. And it's due to the fact that in the guidelines of the modern university, there was an exclusion built in. And these women, they were the first to figure it out. There was something was going terribly wrong at the beginning of the modern society. Did Wumbo respond to that letter? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know what he did? When I first read it, I, I just couldn't believe it. Rachel Levine, she converted when she married Farnhagen because at the time we could not marry a Christian without converting. There was no civil marriage, so she converted. But at the time she was close friends with Humboldt, she was a Jewish woman. And you know what he sent her as a kind of response to this letter? A beautifully carved cross as a necklace. Can you imagine? Ah, ah that's, that's a response. <laughs> Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about the politics that made the third volume not publishable and also whether that affected any of your editorial decisions when I'm so, thinking of the names being removed from it, uh, which yeah. I think was the right decision, but it still made me think sort of how does that make it read in terms of these politics? So when, when Farnham published the, the edition of 34, it was in the middle of, you know, Metternich, bum, 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 bum. So he, 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 he tried to catch all the passages that would not pass the censorship. And when the, when the volume was out, he produced this beautiful piece of art where he, he put each and every page in, in this kind of uh, passepartout and reintegrated all the passages that he had to take out because of censorship. 
and he did not want to republish the book with all the censored passengers. So he, what he wanted is he wanted he wanted to convey his wife's thoughts the way she had thought, and not the way it passes censorship in the 19th century. And um, for, for quite a while, he thought it would change. They thought after 1830, when the, the, the revolution in July of 1830 in Paris, they thought you might go back to the way of revolution and come up with democratic uh, states, did not happen. And then in 1848, when the revolution took over Berlin, he thought, okay, now is the time. Now I can publish the book without any cuts, the way she wrote it. And then, after this revolution did not work out, he decided that he wouldn't try to publish it anymore. But it, what, what's interesting, you know, the texts written by women, they tend to disappear because usually they stay in the family. And the family, if, they, if there's anyone interested, they like to be really harsh censors. And usually no one is interested, so they get lost. And, but what he did, he, uh, in his will, he's very explicit about bringing all these manuscripts to a library, because once it's in the library, it's kind of safe. Libraries can't decide, uh-oh, we don't want that. If it's in the library, it's there. So he really took care of, you know, giving it to the next generations. But I think it was a very, you know, he was, he was, a, he was on the side of the Democrats. It was a very kind of good decision for him to say, I'm not going to publish it censored. Oh, and then what I found, it's, it's really funny, and I published it in, in, in this volume. It had to, the book had to pass censorship in Prussia and in a couple of other states in Germany because there was no German state at the time. And it had to, to, to pass censorship in Austria. Even it's the same edition, you know, the language in Austria is German, it's the same language. But it had to pass censorship in, in, in Austria. So what happened? The Austrian censor went to the book and he was delighted and he was kind of excited and he wrote a poem and a, a letter to Farhagen <coughs> writing to him, I have a really tough job, and usually it's boring, I have to censor all the books, but this book is so fabulous, and I love my job the moment I read this book. <laughs> so, it's a really fun letter. But you know, he, of course he read the censored version, and Farnhagen wanted to prepare